Jayam Vishnu Pad Panam Hoksha Prabhu Jakacharya Asatata Shri Shimad is Divine Grace Sila A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Sila Prabhupada Ki Ananti Kota Vaishnavinda Ki Jai Namacharya Sila Haridas Thakur Ki Jai All glorious are some of the devotees All glorious are some of the devotees All glorious are some of the devotees All glorious are glorious Shri Shri Guru and Shri Gauranga Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So this morning we're reading the Srimad Bhagavatam Canto 3 Chapter 33 Text 1 Do we chant this together or we just read it? Okay. Sri Maitreya said, Thus Devahuti, the mother of Lord Kapila and wife of Kardamamuni, became freed from all ignorance concerning devotional service and transcendental knowledge. She offered her obeisances unto the Lord, the author of the basic principles of the Sankhya system of philosophy, which is the background of liberation, and she satisfied him with the following verses of prayer. Text 2. Devahuti said, Brahma, it is said to be, Brahma is said to be the unborn because he takes birth from the lotus flower which grows from your abdomen while you lie in the ocean at the bottom of the universe. But even Brahma simply meditated upon you, whose body is the source of unlimited universes. Text 3. My dear Lord, although personally you have nothing to do, you have distributed your energies in the interactions of the material modes of nature, and for that reason the creation, maintenance, and dissolution of the cosmic manifestation takes place. My dear Lord, you are self-determined and are the Supreme Personality of Godhead for all living entities. For them, you created this material manifestation, and although you are one, your diverse energies can act multifariously. This is inconceivable to us. Text 4. As the Supreme Personality of Godhead, you have taken birth from my abdomen. O oh my Lord, how is that possible? For the Supreme One, who has in his belly all the cosmic manifestation. The answer is that it is possible, for at the end of the millennium, you lie down on a leaf of a banyan tree, and just like a small baby, you lick the toe of your lotus f foot. Text 5. My dear Lord, you have assumed this body in order to diminish the sinful activities of the fallen and to enrich their knowledge and devotion and liberation. Since these sinful people are dependent on your direction, by your own will, you assume incarnations as a boar and as other forms. Similarly, you have appeared in order to distribute transcendental knowledge to your dependents. Text 6. To say nothing of the spiritual advancement of persons who see the Supreme Person face to face, even a person born in a family of dog eaters immediately becomes eligible to perform Vedic sacrifices if he once utters the holy name of the Supreme Personality of God or chants about him, hears about his pastimes, offers him obeisances, or even remembers him. Text 7. 
This is one of the most famous verses in the Bhagavatam. I don't know if you want to just—I don't know if you want to just go through this and not read the purport. <laughs> I want to, maybe we should. Maybe we should. Make, can I make a suggestion to you? Let's <laughs> let's do it to six. Somebody could start it because seven is one of the most important. You want to focus on seven? Right? We could do that. Yeah, it's uh, it's a very one of the most important verses. Yeah, we could do that. Oh, how glorious are they whose tongues are chanting your holy name. Even if born in a family of dog eaters, such persons are worshipful. Persons who chant the holy name of your lordship must have executed all kinds of austerities and fire sacrifices and achieved all the good manners of the Aryans. To be chanting the holy name of your lordship they must have bathed at holy places of pilgrimage, studied the Vedas, and fulfilled everything required. Text 8. I believe, my Lord, that you are Lord Vishnu himself under the name of Kapila, and you are the Supreme Personality of God the Supreme Brahman. The saints and sages, being freed from all the disturbances of the senses and mind, meditate upon you, for by your mercy only can one become free from the clutches of the three modes of material nature. At the time of dissolution, all the Vedas are sustained in you. So text 7. So uh, since we're short on time, we'll just read it and then you can repeat. Oho bhaja swapacha togriyan Yajjab No, actually there's another meaning Oho bhaja swapacha togriyan Yajjiva grevartate nama tubyam Te pustapas jeju vusasnaraya Brahman or Chur Namagrananti Ete. Oh, but a swap at a togarian. Yet Jeeva grave art at a Nama tubium. They post a pass ye Jehovusasnaraya. Brahmanu chur nama gananti ete. Oho bhata svapacha togriyan. Yajiva grevartate nama tubyam. Te pustapas deju vusasnararya. Oh, but the Oh, how glorious! Swapacha, a dog eater. Atta, hence, Gariyan, 
वर्षभो यूम जीवाग्रे ऑन द टिप ऑफ द टंग वर्तते इज नाम द होली नेम तुभ्यम अंतु यु ते तु ते पुतपा प्रैक्टिस ऑस्टेरिटीज ते दे जुहु एक्सेक्यूटेड फायर सैक्रिफाइसेस शशनो took bath in the sacred rivers arya aryans brahmanuchu studied the vedas nama the holy name gananti accept ye they who te your Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, Shri Ravan Ki Jai. So we'll read that again. Oh, how glorious are they whose tongues are chanting Your holy name, even if born in a family of dog eaters. Such persons are worshipable. Persons who chant the holy name of Your Lordship must have executed all kinds of austerities and fire sacrifices, and achieved all the good manners of the Aryans. to be chanting the holy name of your lordship they must have bathed at holy places of pilgrimage studied the vedas and fulfilled everything required so i guess we were all doing those things <laughs> prophet's mercy prophet as it is stated in the previous verse a person who has once offensively chanted the holy name of god becomes immediately immediately eligible to perform vedic sacrifices one should not be astonished by this statement of the shrimad bhagavatam and you see that's the key here is is to chant offenselessly like prabhupad said that if we chant our 16 rounds and follow the four regular principles throughout our life then we can go back to godhead but the quality of the chanting has to be there and like the, one of the main offenses that we chant or that we do is we chant in a, inattentively anybody have that experience here yeah <laughs> it's not easy the mind is as bhakti siddhanta saraswati thakur said the mind is a non devotee it's a rascal it does want to hear the holy name that's why it's so hard to hear so this it's a big challenge actually and probably the biggest challenge we'll face in this life is to chant pure japa pure attentive japa so we might learn, we're going to learn something in this purport here one should not disbelieve or think how by chanting the holy name of the lord can one become a holy man to be compared to the most elevated brahmana to eradicate such doubts in the minds of unbelievers this verse affirms that the stage of chanting of the holy name of the lord is not sudden but that the chanters have already performed all kinds of vedic rituals and sacrifices it is not very astounding for for no one in this life can chant the holy name of the lord unless he has passed all lower stages such as performing the vedic ritualistic sacrifices studying the vedas and practicing good behavior like that of the aryans all this must first have been done just as a student in a law class is to be understood to have already graduated from general education anyone who is engaged in the chanting of the holy name of the lord hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 ram hare ram 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 hare hare 
must have already passed all lower stages. It is said that those who simply chant the holy name with the tip of the tongue are glorious. One does not even have to chant the holy name and understand the whole procedure, namely the offensive stage, the offenseless stage, and the pure stage. If the holy name is sounded on the tip of the tongue, that is also sufficient. It is said herein that Nam, a singular number, one name, Krishna, or Ram, is sufficient but it has to be purely. <laughs> it is not that one has to chant all the holy names of the Lord. The holy names of the Lord are innumerable. How many names of the Lord are there? <laughs> Prabhupada gives the example like waves in the ocean. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of waves in the ocean. So many names, so many incarnations of Krishna. The holy names of the Lord are innumerable and one does not have to chant all the names to prove that he has already undergone all the processes of Vedic ritualistic ceremonies. If one chants only, or just if one chants once only, it is to be understood that he has already passed all the examinations, not to speak of those who are chanting always, 24 hours a day. It is specifically said here, Tubyam, unto you only. One must chant God's name, not as the Mayavadi philosophers say, any name, such as the demigod's name or the names of, uh, of God's energies. Only the holy name of the Supreme Lord will be effective. Anyone who compares the holy name of the Supreme Lord to the names of the demigods is called a pashandi or an offender. Like Prabhupada used to say that, if you chant, John, 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 Bill, 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 what are we gonna? What's gonna? What's the effect gonna be? <laughs> huh? Yeah, it's not. There's no. There's no transcendental. It's not a transcendental vibration. But the names of Krishna, these are transcendental vibrations. The holy name has to be chanted to please the Supreme Lord and not for any sense gratification or professional purpose. If this pure mentality is there, then even though a person is born in a low family such as a dog eaters, he is so glorious that not only has he purified himself, but he is quite competent to deliver others. He is competent to speak on the importance of the transcendental name, just as Thakur Haridas did. He was apparently born in a family of Mohammedans. But because he was chanting the holy name of the Supreme Lord offenselessly, Lord Chaitanya empowered him to become the authority or the acharya of spreading the holy name. Haridas Thakur, he was born in a family of Muslims. And that's considered like, you know, in that level of dog eater, they, were, they would eat meat. Also, they would eat cow. But Lord Chaitanya, he came to, to make it clear that anybody from any background can become a devotee of Krishna. Because this is Kali Yuga, and in Kali Yuga, Practically everybody is degraded. It's said that, that, that demons take birth in Brahmin families. You know, Kali Yuga is so degraded. So Lord Chaitanya came to let, to let it be known that anybody from any background can become a great devotee. And Lord Chaitanya, he taught uh, very important principles through four devotees. He taught through Ramananda Roy that it's possible to overcome Cupid and become free of lust. He was so transcendental. He, was, he used to teach drama. And sometimes he would have to teach young girls. And he would touch their private parts. But it was like touching wood. 
for him because he just saw it as material, just material energy. And what is the body? It's just material energy, right? It's just bones and skin and blood. So that's how he saw it, just completely transcendental, Ramana and Roy. He taught through Haridas Thakur. Anybody know? Tolerance. Tolerance. Because the Muslims, the, the, the Muslim leaders, they were appalled. They couldn't believe. How is it that you know, you're born in such a high family, Muslim family, you, you become a Hindu? How? Why? Why? And he... Haridas Thakur was so transcendental, he kind of, he, he laughed at them. And just see how the material energy is. It's so thick yeah, that you're thinking that you're Muslim and they're Hindu, but we're all spirit souls. We are, we're all part of God. Yeah. So many uh, Hindus have become Muslim, so one Muslim becomes a Hindu. What's the big deal? So he, he, he was amused, actually. So they thought, all oh, right, this person is just, he should be beaten. How many marketplaces? 22. They were beating him. Two big guys are beating him. But what was Haridas Thakur doing? He was praying. He was praying, please forgive them, Krishna. Please forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Lord Chaitanya wanted to kill them. But because Haridas Thakur was praying for their deliverance, Lord Chaitanya came and he accepted the beating on his back. And therefore Haridas Thakur, that's why he was just chanting. He was blissfully just chanting Hare Krishna. And the people couldn't believe it. He's, he's being beaten, but he's not being affected. And what to speak of the guys that were beating him? Yeah. <laughs> And by the time the 22 market, marketplaces were finished, they were beating him, they were lamenting. And Haridas Thakur said, why are you lamenting? We were supposed to kill you. We, this is, now we're going to go back and we didn't do our job, so now we're going to be punished. And Haridas Thakur, what did he say? He said, all right, I'll die for you. <laughs> and he went into complete samadhi. No life symptoms. So then they were very happy. Oh, he's dead. Oh, good. Let's take him back. Show him we killed him. And then they took his body there and, and they were just trying to decide what to do with him. Should we bury him or throw him in the river? Ah, just throw him in the river. You know, he doesn't deserve to be buried. You know, so they threw him in the river. And then what did Haridas Thakur do? He started swimming and he swam to shore and he continued chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. And then he went back to, the, to where the, uh, the leaders of the Muslim, the Islam, they went back to them. He said, hey, we thought you were dead. Oh, still alive. And then they said, listen, you just do whatever you want to do. We can understand now you're a saint. Because they could see he was dead, but now he's alive chanting. So Haridas Thakur was such a, a special soul. So he was the example of tolerance. And Sanatan Goswami, he taught humility. Such a humble soul. He was, he was a leader. He was, a, he was a, a prime minister in the Muslim government. But upon hearing about Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he decided, I don't want to deal with this anymore, this nonsense government. He wanted to take shelter of Lord Chaitanya. So uh, he was able to escape. And uh, he went to Lord Chaitanya, him and Rupa Goswami, they went to Lord Chaitanya with straw between their teeth. Very, this is a, it's a sign of humility. And he was praising Lord Chaitanya and expressing how fallen they were 
And Lord Chaitanya was so touched, he said, you're melting my heart with your humility. Please stop. So humble. This is a symptom of a devotee. Dorgime putimandase skalat pada gatirmahu. Svakipa yastidane na santasan vavalampano. Krishnadas Kaviraj, he says, my path is very difficult. I'm blind. My feet are slipping again and again. Therefore, may the saintly devotees help me by granting me uh, the stick of their mercy as my support. This is the humility of a Vaishnava. He's saying he's blind, slipping again. But he was one, probably one of the he was one of the greatest Vaishnavas on the planet. And what else did he say? He said, I'm, I'm lower than a worm in stool. Anybody chants my name loses all pious credits. And he wasn't just saying words. He actually felt. He felt this. In, inconceivable humility. Prabhupada says in one purport that the, the, the highest humility that a person can experience is when one becomes a pure devotee. When we become pure devotees, then we'll know what humility is. Because a pure devotee is always thinking of the greatness of Krishna. Just wants to serve Krishna. And he th how does he think of himself? Very insignificant. How insignificant are we? How big are we? How big are we? One ten thousand size of a tip of a hair. In other words, even the most powerful microscope can't see the soul. I'm not seeing you now. You're seeing this body. I'm seeing your body. But we're not seeing each other. We're just seeing this external, this, uh, this body. But this is not who we are. We can't see the soul. It's subtle. It's so subtle. But it's mentioned in the Bhagavatam that the most subtle is Krishna. He's the most subtle. He's everywhere. But we can't see him. Some, some can see him. Some can see him. There's one nice pastime of Prabhupada. You want to hear a nice pastime of Prabhupada? Yeah. Prabhupada was at one temple. And there was a devotee asked to, to guard Prabhupada. You know, be at his door. I guess maybe they're in a bad neighborhood or something. So this devotee was was there at the door, and he heard some some rumbling going on in the room. And he looked through the keyhole, you know, one of those old buildings, you know. And he saw Prabhupada on the floor, kind of rolling around on the floor. N next morning, when he, he saw Prabhupada, he said. Prabhupada, I was, I was at your door. I was guarding your door. And there was some rumbling going on. Some, and I looked through the keyhole, and you were moving around on the floor. If you don't mind me asking, well, what, what was that? He said, oh, I was, I was uh, wrestling with Balaram. <laughs> but the devotee couldn't see that. <laughs> this is uh, told to me by Bhakti Siddhanta. Bhakti Siddhanta is one of the most senior devotees in Iskand. He's the one that, that made a lot of these murtis that Prabhupada. He's still, he's like 80 years old now. He's still working on the, on the TOVP. He's like, an, um, he's like a, such an amazing devotee. So, actually there's another nice pastime. There was an interview Prabhupada was having with, with a, a, a newspaper interviewer and some other devotees are there and, and this, this interviewer said, can you see God? And Prabhupada said, yes. And one of the devotees said, well, he's, he sees God in, in the form of that he sees the, the energy of God. And Prabhupada said, no, I see God. And the devotee and the interviewer like, okay. <laughs> Prabhupada was seeing God and it's actually natural it's natural to see God because we're all part of God. 
we're the sons, we're the daughters of God. So he's our father, it's natural that we should be able to see God. But because of the impurities, we can't see Krishna. So what we're doing by this chanting and by this hearing and serving is we're, we're becoming cleansed. We're shining the soul. Yeah. It's like if you take some, some uh, gold and you shine it, it becomes very beautiful. You shine it, shine it, shine it. It becomes very attractive. So that's what we're doing when we're chanting. We're shining the soul. And eventually all the gunk will come off and we'll be shining souls. Yeah. And then we could again see Krishna. Oh, and there's one other. So that was three. Sanatana Goswami, Haridas Thakur, Ramananda Roy, and the other one was, uh, who was the, the devotee that uh, would sometimes correct Lord Chaitanya? No, no. He would offend. <laughs> Not Jagannath upon it. No. no Damar, Damodar Pandit? I think Damodar Pandit, yes. So he would, he, he would show how to uh, engage in constructional criticism. He would correct. Amazing pastime. <laughs> Lord, Lord Chaitanya there was, uh, was in, in, uh, in Puri, and this, this boy would come and visit Lord Chaitanya every day. Very nice, Krishna conscious boy. So Damodar Pandit said to Lord Chaitanya, Lord Chaitanya, this boy is very nice, but he's the son of a lady who has no husband. She's a widow. And people are going to start talking. <laughs> if you keep this up, then people are going to start talking because she has no husband. So Lord Chaitanya, he... Uh, he wasn't very pleased with that. <laughs> and Prabhupada mentions that, that devotees should not uh, instruct Lord Chaitanya. Uh, so I think it was he, Lord Chaitanya sent him to Nabadweep, wasn't it? Yeah. So he, he was going a little too far. <laughs> but it's mentioned in, the, in, the, in one purport, Prabhupada says that he was the, the teacher of constructional criticism. I guess with Lord Chaitanya, he should have been a little more <laughs> easy on it. So here, continuing. He was apparently born in a family of Mohammedans, but because he was chanting the holy name of the Supreme Lord offenselessly, Lord Chaitanya empowered him to become the authority or the acharya, the spreading of the holy name. It did not matter that he was born in a family which was not following the Vedic rules and regulations. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Advaita Prabhu accepted him, excuse me, as an authority because he was offenselessly chanting the name of the Lord. Authorities like Advaita Prabhu and Lord Chaitanya immediately accepted that he had already performed all kinds of austerities, studied the Vedas, and performed all sacrifices that is automatically understood. There is a hereditary class of brahmanas called the smarter brahmanas, however, who are of the opinion that even if such persons who are chanting the holy name of the Lord are accepted as purified, they still have to perform the Vedic rites or await their next birth in a family of brahmanas so that they can perform the Vedic rituals. There's another nice pastime of Prabhupada in Vrindavan. Some devotees were going around different temples and they were showing some, you know, they're nice devotees, so they're showing some devotion to the deities. And the Pujari saw that. He said, because you're showing so much devotion to the deities here, in your next life, you'll be born brahmanas. 
So they went back and they told Prabhupada. And Prabhupada said, you should have told them that if you worship the deities very nicely, you'll be born into the Sankirtan movement. <laughs> Continuum. But actually, that is not the case. Such a man does not need to wait for the next birth to become purified. He is at once purified. It is understood that he has already performed all sorts of rites. It is the so-called brahmanas who actually have to under, undergo different kinds of austerities before reaching that point of purification. Prabhupada would give the example that, you know, they, it's, it's just so ridiculous that you, if you're born into the family of brahmanas, you're automatically a brahmana. He would give the example just like someone's born into a, a family of doctors. And you know, the mother's a doctor, the father's a doctor. Automatically, the son is a doctor. It's ridiculous, right? No, he's got to go to school also. He's got to go through the whole medical school, the whole thing, and he's got to pass. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, they have, it's, by, it's by quality, not by janma, not by birth. There are many other Vedic performances which are not described here. All such Vedic rituals have been already performed by the chanters of the Holy Name. The word Juhuvu means that the chanters of the Holy Name have already performed all kinds of sacrifices. Shashnu means that they have already traveled to all the holy places of pilgrimage and taken part in the purificatory activities at those places. They are called Arya because they have already finished all the requirements and therefore they must be among the Aryans or those who have qualified themselves to become Aryans. Aryan refers to those who are civilized, whose manners are regulated according to the Vedic rituals any devotee who is chanting the holy name of the Lord is the best kind of Aryan. Unless one studies the Vedas, one cannot become an Aryan. But it is automatically understood that the chanters have already studied all the Vedic literature. The specific word used here is anuchuhu, which means that because they have already completed all the recommended acts. They have become qualified to become spiritual masters. The very word grananti, which is used in this verse, means to be already established in the perfectional stage of ritualistic performances. If one is seated on the bench of a high court and is giving judgment on cases, it means that he has already passed all legal exams and is better than those who are engaged in the study of law or those expecting to study law in the future. In a similar way, persons who are already chanting the holy name are transcendental to those who are factually performing the Vedic rituals and those who expect to be qualified or, in other words, those who are born in families of brahmanas but have not yet undergone the reformatory processes and who therefore expect to study the Vedic rituals and perform the sacrifices in the future. There are many Vedic statements in different places saying that anyone who chants the holy name of the Lord becomes immediately freed from conditional life and that anyone who hears the holy name of the Lord even though born of a family of dog eaters, also becomes liberated from the clutches of material entanglement. In our teachings, there's a very important verse. Kaler doshanad he rajan, asti he kumahagina, kirtanadeva krishnasya mukta sangha, that in this age of Kali, there's many faults. Wherever you go, there's many faults. Uh, 
But the one good quality of the sage is that simply by chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, one can become completely purified of all contamination and be qualified to enter into the kingdom of God. So this is the power of the holy name. So many faults in this age. I was speaking to one student at a university about this, how there's so many faults in the leadership, there's so many faults, the, the government leaderships, even also in the religious leadership, there's so many discrepancies, so many faults. And this student said, oh yeah, you won't believe it. I was just reading in the newspaper. There was one psychiatrist who was treating a, a patient. And this patient had about six different split personalities. So the doctor decided to charge each of the split personalities. So one of the split personalities had enough intelligence to take this person to court. And the judge couldn't believe it. <laughs> He, he gave him a big fine and he took away his license. He actually had to go to jail for two years. So you would expect a doctor to be honest, to be fair. But no, this age, I also, I had a re recent experience with a, uh, with a dentist. I have a friend, he said, Vijay, whatever you need, you just tell me, I'll take care of it, don't worry. I said, well, I have some teeth problems. He said, don't worry about it, I, have a, I, have a, I know somebody. Else. So I went to this dentist, $47,000 to fix my teeth. And when I walked out of that place, they were worse than when I went in. Can you believe it? $47,000. It's just business, you know, just ridiculous. <laughs> so this is the Kali Yuga. So cheaters and the cheated, yeah. So actually Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur told his disciples, don't go to dentists. <laughs> I guess it was, it was like that back then, you know. So yeah, it's a very degraded age, but the handicap of this age is that simply by chanting this Hare Krishna mantra, we can become purified. Won't that be nice? Huh? Not dealing with the modes of material nature anymore. Prabhupada said there's another mode. There's the three modes of nature, and then there's another one. It's called the pure mode. The pure mode. The devotional mode of nature. That's Krishna. That's under Krishna. So that's what we want. We want, we want to be under that mode. We're just completely absorbed in Krishna. Just want to serve Krishna. So, is there any questions or comments? J. Prabhu, thank you, thank you, thank you for gracing our temple with your preaching presence and your book distribution acumen. And I'm just going to take an opportunity here. Um, we have a beautiful book that's available uh, that V.J. Prabhu has compiled, and it's first class. It's such a beautiful book. And I received one yesterday. Uh, by the grace of Vijay Prabhu and Srila Prabhupada and Gurudev and Shishi Radha Kalachanji. And so I cannot emphasize enough, please get that book. It will fire you up for Sankirtan and you will always see opportunities. The name of the book again is? It's Treasures of the Brihat Murdanga. Treasures of the Brihat Murdanga. Yeah, a lot of nice stories and uh, realizations of senior devotees and yeah, it's, uh, I have a case of them yeah. so uh, I'll the be here question? For, a, for a week <laughs> you have a oh, question I'm yeah I'm so sorry didn't mean to interrupt 
Um, you'll have you'll be there for a week, and he has the books at Jai Gurunga's house, right? Yes. So we can stop by, give donation for the book. Okay. And if you catch him at the right time, he'll even sign it for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, the question is: is cooperation? Yes. Shila Prabhupada was so keen on that um, when his departure was coming up. He was keen, and he would constantly cooperation, cooperation, cooperation. That's a sign of your love. And so I find out in certain dealings with devotees, and it's probably me, that we want to, quote, unquote, be in charge. Or we can't just be the assistant of another and just be a menial servant and just be glad to cooperate and to help push like that. So the question is, is, is japa, is the quality of our chanting, is that directly linked to that mood of humble cooperation? Is that, is that where we get that from? Yes. You answered your own question. <laughs> yes. Just by chanting the Hare Krishna mantra, we can uh, overcome all the problems of material life. You know, the pride and the, and the greed and the lust and so many, so many contaminations are there. But this is, uh, that's the power of the holy name. Krishna and his name are non-different. So Krishna will help us if we sincerely chant the holy name. Krishna will, will help us. Now Prabhupada said different things about the holy name, how to chant. He said like a child crying out to the mother. And we've all heard children crying for their mother. It's pretty intense. <laughs> he said also we, we should pray like, Krishna, please accept me. My friend, my friend, my friend, please accept me. Again, so, yeah, again, yeah, the mind is the, is the problem. I'll tell you, one of the best, I don't know if I've said this before, some of you may not have heard this, I always like to mention this because it's one of the best things I've ever heard about chanting the holy name. There was a devotee, some of you may have met him, Bhakti Tirtha Swami, I'm sure, Nishinga Rupa has met him many times. He's a very wonderful sannyasi. Unfortunately, he passed away some years ago. But the way he would chant japa is, uh, if he was chanting and he found he was inattentive, he was thinking of something else, he would stop and he would back up one or two beads. And then he would go forward just to check the mind. Otherwise, as we've experienced, the mind just goes off and goes off, and it's often Timbuktu, so it's just like it just keeps going. You know? So this, um, as soon as he, he noticed that his mind was not, he would stop, back up, and then he'd go forward. So as I mentioned earlier, Bhakti Siddhanta says, Swati Thakur, he said the mind is a non-devotee, it's a rascal. So we have to kind of preach to our mind. I know you don't want to chant, but now we're on a new program. If you're not attentive, we're going to chant more. <laughs> so I told this to one, I mentioned this to one devotee. He said, if I did that, it would take me all day to chant my 16 rounds because I'd have to keep on back. <laughs> the mind is such a rascal. So I've been doing that, for, I don't know, I've been doing that for about 12 years now. It's really good. Another thing Prabhupada said, if you want to chant good japa, chant it uninterrupted. And the best time, actually, now this, is, this might be a little hard to believe for you, but Prabhupada said the best time to chant your japa, before Mangalartik. Because <laughs> then there's no, after Mangalartik, it becomes a little, you know, things start happening, especially after breakfast, then things really start happening. You know, just, it's very hard to chant attentive japa after breakfast. Yeah. 
just because it's just just the material energy starts acting much more. So I've been doing that for about ten years, ever since I heard Prabhupada say that. And I've, my the best shop I've ever chanted is when I do that. I've only fallen asleep, I think, once, maybe twice. Yeah. When you when you chant before my alarm, so something. Even when I would wake up and I only had four hours sleep, still I wouldn't fall asleep. When I was chanting my job before Mongolarti, there's something about that period. <laughs> so, you had a question? <laughs> okay, so one of these two, they're both, they're both very humble, so they're saying, no, no, you chant, no, no, you, no, no, you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Prabhuji, for your wonderful class. Thank you. So I have one comment and one question. Okay. If time permits. So um, you described the beautiful, beautiful Prabhupada pastime about uh, Shila Prabhupada wrestling with Balaram. Uh, no wonder, you know, he's been described as the commander in chief of all the devotees. So that uh, reminds me uh, uh, when I had an opportunity to serve Brahmananda Prabhu. So he personally told this to me. He said, Maybe put the mic a little closer. There you go. So Brahmananda Prabhu, he personally told this to me. What's his name? Brahmananda. Oh, Brahmananda. Brahmananda. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so uh, this was, uh, there was this Juhu Silver Jubilee celebrations back in Mumbai. So I happened to serve him, so, so he told this pastime to me. So he was guarding Srila Prabhupada's tent or something. And um, after some time, he happened to hear there was some whisper going on inside. So he just took a peek through a hole of the tent and he saw Prabhupada was sitting on his knees and there were tears rolling down his cheeks and he was talking. So he couldn't hear exactly what he was talking. So after some time he went inside and he asked Srila Prabhupada, Prabhupada, who are you talking to? I couldn't see anyone you know, inside. So he said, I was talking to Krishna. But then he told me that he didn't dare to ask him what exactly was the conversation about. <laughs> that is the comment. Very nice, the thank you. Question. Wait, question let me uh, just, just wait for your question. I, I got another similar, and then you could ask your question. Okay. Would you like to discuss that? Prabhupada was in, in, in New Dwarka, <laughs> and this is 1970, and he was trying to, uh, things were not right there at that temple at that time, and he was feeling a little, very uncomfortable. Some of the devotees were uh, minimizing the position of Prabhupada. This it was a very heavy time back in 1970. So Dwarkadis told Prabhupada, it's okay, you go back to India, I'll take care of everything. Yeah. So Prabhupada said, Dwarkadis spoke to him, the deity spoke to him, you go back to India, now you could spread Krishna consciousness there. And that, that's when he went, uh, in 1970, he went back to India. So yeah, Prabhupada would speak to the deities. And there's that pastime in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, also of uh, the deity speaking to a devotee. And now the question. I don't know if we have enough time. Actually, if you think fit and if you so desire, we would love to hear how you came to Krishna consciousness and uh, your probably first meeting with Srila Prabhupada and what exactly, what was it that inspired you to distribute his books and become a book, book distributor. Okay, yeah, that would take champion. some time. But am, am I scheduled to give class on Sunday? Okay, so come on Sunday. Everybody, it's a nice thing that people like to hear how people join. You know? Oh, what, what inspired me to distribute books? There's a person here in, in, the, in the temple compound, Hridan Nandamaras. Actually, he's my spiritual master. Because because I'm old, I, I look. I, people think I'm a Prabhupada disciple. I got. I, I'm. <laughs> so I joined in '78. I, I I joined nine months after Prabhupada left, so I I just missed the boat. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, so Hridan he 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 gave great great inspiration for me to distribute books, and yeah, he was he was he he was. He used to distribute books as a sannyasi, as a GBC, and he gave a lot of, he, in Brazil, they were just going, they were on fire also, all over South America, actually. 
there, he, he, Prabhupada really, actually Prabhupada told him, he said, we should have only one motto in Krishna consciousness, read and distribute books. He said this should be our only motto, <laughs> read and distribute books, read and distribute books. <laughs> Okay, so Sunday I'll I'll tell you the whole story. Yeah, it's getting a little late. It's it's a, no no next Sunday, not this. Yeah, next Sunday evening, Sunday program. Thank you very much, Hare Krishna.